Well, I'd like to ask you to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. Earlier this week in uh, my private personal devotional time, I, I read a devotion by Oswald Chambers, my utmost for his highest, a tremendous devotional. Uh, now, Oswald Chambers will get on your feet sometimes. He's very straightforward. Uh, but in that, he talked about the stinging rebuke, the stinging rebuke of hearing Jesus look at you and say, O oh, ye of little faith, and, and how they must have felt to hear those words when they had an opportunity to shine for the Lord, they dropped the ball. That's just what happened. And so uh, for him to say those words, well, I want to tell you something. I got to thinking about the scripture that that devotional was written on, and the more I thought about it, the more I wanted to share with you guys today about uh, uh, this passage because it, not only is it timely, and I think it will encourage us, but at the same time, uh, it is a general reminder that uh, in life, we're going to have some inopportune times. We're going to have moments that are tough. It's part of living. And with that, uh, we should be able to, uh, to know that the Lord's in charge and in control of our life. So I want to start in Matthew chapter 8 and verse 23. Matthew 28, verse 23. Now when Jesus got into a boat, his disciples followed him. And suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea, so that the boat was covered with the waves, but Jesus was asleep. Then his disciples came to him and woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. But Jesus said to them, Why are you fearful, O you of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. So the men marveled, saying, Who can this be? that even the winds and the sea obey him. Now this simple little moment in the life of, of Jesus and his disciples began when they came to a shoreline, there was a boat, Jesus stepped into the boat, and those with him followed him into the boat. I mean, this is when it started, uh, is, is the moment they got into the boat. But I want you to see something. A true disciple follows their leader. So when Jesus walked into the boat, they did too. It wasn't a second thought about it. It wasn't, uh, should we stay or should we go? Should I, should I stay here on the land? That Most of these uh, were fishermen, so they were very familiar with the sea. I don't know if they could have looked up in the clouds and sky and told that there was inclement weather there. I don't know that. I know I've read uh, in some of the water uh, bodies of water in that region that there's, it's very shallow in certain places, and when a storm does come up, it causes the waves to really churn up quickly. And so uh, that, that, that action was going on. Jack, you've been there, so you, you might give us some insight on some of that. But uh, in this case, uh, they entered the boat and they pushed out to sea. But I want us to see that, that they followed the leader. Now, it turns out by their following Jesus, they're fixing to be in a storm that's going to threaten their life. I want you to see that. They're with Jesus they followed him. He's the leader. They're following him uh, obediently, and they're following him because he's leading them. And in the middle of following him and being with him, they're fixing to find themselves in a life or death situation. Do you see that when you read this story? Because that's what happened. Had they remained on the shore, they wouldn't have been threatened a whole lot by a storm. A thunderstorm standing on the beach, with the exception of maybe getting struck by lightning, uh, is not nearly as dangerous as a thunderstorm when you're out in the water with, in this case, the waves that literally were overcoming the boat. Now, how big the boat was, I don't know. In my mind, I'm looking at the size of a shrimp boat. I know that's not true. I know it was a lot smaller boat, but in my mind, I'm seeing a little bit bigger boat than it probably was, uh, but, but it was still overloaded. I had a deacon in a church that I pastored that invited me to go fishing with him one day. And I'm not a little guy. I mean, I'm a pretty big old boy. And this guy had a big old $40,000 bass boat. I'm talking about one of those that goes straight up in the air before it goes. And uh, I was more excited about riding the fancy boat than I was going fishing, to be honest with you. And uh, uh, Gerald and I loaded up, and I got over there. And you know what he had behind his truck? He had a 10-foot aluminum boat with a trolling motor on it, a 10-foot. When I stood on the end of it, it went straight up. And the whole time, every time you throw your line, the whole, 
Look, Ed, I was a nervous wreck, but I said, Gerald, next time you're going to have to bring your bigger boat, son. I don't know if I can handle this. So I don't know for sure what kind of boat they had, but let me tell you something. Sometimes we have the false idea that if I'm faithful to the Lord and I'm obedient to the Lord and I'm following the Lord, that nothing that would be trouble will ever find me. That's just not true. That's not true. As a matter of fact, Jesus didn't insulate us from the from the tr uh, tragedy and, and the, the toughness of living this world. He told us that in this world we would have many troubles and many trials. He told us that. What his encouragement was is that we could be uh, restful and comforted to know that he's overcome the world. Whatever we might face, he's overcome it. And so I, I want us to see that. I want us to see that we can follow Jesus and still have life-threatening moments in our life it's not because we've done something wrong. It's not because we're not living right. It's not because uh, 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 we have something that, that we feel that uh, shouldn't be in our life, and, and certainly the Lord could chasten us. But if you can lay your head on the pillow at night knowing that you are following Christ and you're surrendered to Him and He's your Lord and He's the leader and you're not and you're following after Him, if you can do that and encounter a storm, then what you can do is back up and recognize this storm is for a reason. There's a purpose for this. God has got something he's going to teach me in this, and I believe that's exactly what happened in this moment. But look, had they stayed on the shore or the dry land, the danger level would have been pretty low that day, and I'm telling you the excitement level would have been very little. When you have a boat on the water and you mix it with a vehement wind, you have waves, in this case, that threaten to capsize the boat. And that's where we find ourselves. Jesus, disciples, boat in a storm. So this is what the scenario is. Now, whatever imagination you have to use, I don't know. I've been in a, a storm. I, I think that's why I think of the shrimp boat. Dad had a shrimp boat, and we got in a storm one time. And I've remembered that well my entire life. I've shared it with you on a few occasions in, uh, in, in illustration. But I've remembered that for most of my life because I was scared to death. I think my dad was scared to death. I think it blew up on us before we realized it and it got bad way quicker than we thought it would. So I remember that. And I, so I sort of liken that to here. Now, if you've never been in that situation, I think everybody in here has been in a situation where something suddenly occurred. So keep that in mind as we sort of move through. The question I want to begin with is simple. But it's profound, I think. Where would you rather be? Would you rather be safe on the shoreline watching? Or would you rather be in the boat with Jesus living? Think about that. I think we're content to watch life sometimes instead of get right in the middle of it. So think about that as we go. Now today I want to talk to you just a very simple concept. How to sleep through a storm how to sleep through a storm. In our text, the Bible says when they were in the boat that suddenly this tempest came. The tempest consisted of two things. It was wind, it was water, and it involved the boat. But when you see the word suddenly, you recognize how quickly and how fast our life circumstances can change. You can be walking along living life and enjoying life and having the time of your life, and all of a sudden, in a moment, things can completely change that will alter the direction of your life for the rest of your life. That can happen. And that has happened, and it does happen. But I want us to see that life can change suddenly. And in this case, life is going to change for the disciples in a sudden way, not only are they going to fear for their life, but they're going to learn something about Jesus that they would have never learned had they stayed on the shore. They're going to learn something about Jesus that they never would have learned had they not been in the boat, and they're going to learn something about Jesus had they not ever learned if there hadn't have been a storm that threatened their life. So, Lord, when I encounter the storms of life, prepare me to hear and to listen to obey, to follow. And maybe not in that order. Maybe follow first and then the others. 
Here's another point I want us to think about. You cannot prepare yourself for circumstances that happen suddenly. <laughs> you can't do it. You can only react. You can't prepare for it. You, we all say, well, let me tell you what I'll do. I'm going to tell you what i do. i tell you what, if, if somebody, I saw somebody acting belligerent and, 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 and being foolish, i tell you what I'll do. I'll make a citizen's arrest. I had a good friend of mine that got in a situation with an inebriated person. That means a person that was very drunk. And it escalated quickly. And these macho men who were macho men, these ain't, these ain't, these ain't little puppies. These were men. And they weren't threatened by this drunk until he pulled a revolver and stuck it right in his face. And he told me, he said, let me tell you something, bud. He said, we all talk tough, but it stops when a gun's stuck in your face. And you can think you're going to do what you're going to do till it happens. But when it happens, <laughs> you ain't going to do nothing but look at that barrel. And there's a lot of truth to that. You and I have encountered times in our lives when we were overwhelmed with the suddenness of it. It may be a bad report. It could be something sudden in your health. It could be a life-altering moment. It could be something at work. It, it could be a myriad of things. But when life suddenly takes a turn that you didn't expect, you cannot be prepared for that. You can think you're prepared for that. But let me tell you what you will do. You will react to that. And your reaction to something that happens so suddenly will reveal the depth of your faith and the truth of what you confess. Now let that sink in. When you have a moment that turns your life inside out, in this case, in this case, it was a life or death moment where their lives were threatened. They were scared. And in that very moment, they revealed the depth of their faith and, and the truth of their confession. Now, the beautiful part about that, even though they were afraid, and we, we can look back and, and we can talk about how big of a sissy they were and it wouldn't have been us, we'd have done the same thing, folks. But listen, the depth of their faith, the, Jesus said your faith is little, that's why you're fearful. But look what they did, though. They did do something that showed the truth of their confession. When their life was threatened, they cried out to Jesus. That's who they went running for. Even though he was asleep, they knew if anybody can fix it, he can. I'm going to tell you something. That doesn't happen today too often. When people's lives get turned inside out, Jesus is about the third or fourth person people turn to. They'll go to everybody, everything, every reason, every fault until Jesus, and usually that's because all the others have run out. Oh, that we might learn to live our confession that if, we're, if our life's in danger and we're threatened and it's suddenly, let's run to Christ first. Does it mean you can't go and see other people and get help, but let's go to Christ first. That's what happens when suddenly comes on us. Now, when they looked at Jesus, he was sleeping. And I was thinking about that. Why was Jesus asleep? And two thoughts came to my mind. The first is this. I think it shows a part of the human side of Jesus Christ and how taxing his ministry was. He got on a boat away from the crowd with his disciples. I can just see that boat kind of rocking and him just getting relaxed and being so tired and weary and just falling asleep. I, I, I can see that. I really can when Tracy and I go for a, a, a trip or something, I can almost guarantee you she's going to be out in about 20 minutes. Something about that driving, and it's just something about it. Unfortunately, I like to do the same thing, and I'm the one driving. So I have to be a little more careful. But it's something. I think, I think Jesus sleeping, first and foremost, probably shows us that he was worn out, physically just tired. And, I, I mean, I could make a big spiritual do how about that, but I don't think I need to. There's times for us to rest, and our bodies need it, and we were created to rest. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay to rest. Our society today in the United States of America 
uh, is a go, 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 go. People like to boast and brag. I work 60 hours a week. I work 80 hours a week. I was, I was reading something the other day where guys that are, are working from home uh, have learned to double their salaries. You know how they double their salaries? They took a second job and they just kind of juggle the calendar to, to make sure the meetings don't coincide. But one, one technical programmer wrote this. He said, listen, honestly, I get paid for 40 hours a week when I go to office. But he said, I really wasn't working but about eight hours. The rest of it was meetings and, and stuff I had to do, not stuff I needed to do. So he just got him a second job and doubled his salary during all this pandemic. <laughs> he just, just, but see, our society rewards that. That's the coolest thing in the world. Boast on how much you work and how tired you are and all these things. Folks, I want to tell you something. You burn it on both ends, and one day it's going to meet in the middle, and you're going to fall apart. There's nothing wrong with resting. So I think that, that in and of itself, I think, is a lesson to be learned. But look at this. I want you to think of something else, too. Jesus could sleep because he was in absolute control of everything and was at perfect peace. People who have trouble sleeping usually have trouble sleeping because their hearts are troubled. There may be some physical reasons, but most people have things. You ever gone to bed with something on your mind? Don, you and I kind of do this. You'll wake up and... If I can wake up and stay sleepy, I might go back to sleep. But if I start thinking about the Bible for one second, that's it. <laughs> I, I, I'm up. I can't go back to bed. If my brain engages at all, I'm done. Got to get on up. Usually try to study and read. Some of the best studying time, but that's normally how that works. The question they wondered is, how can Jesus be sleeping through such? How are you able to sleep when a storm is raging around you? And let me, let, me, let me word that a little different. How do we learn to rest when our world is turned upside down all around us? How do we learn to rest when all of that is happening, okay? Now, I want to talk about Jesus first because he really is the star of this story, isn't he? The first thing is, if you want to rest in a storm, you need to know who you are. You need to know who you are. Now, Jesus Christ didn't have any trouble knowing who he was. He knew that he was the Son of God. He knew that he was living to obey the Father completely. He knew that his life was a life that was going to end on a cross. He knew that he was going to die for the sins of man. He knew what his life was going to be like. He knew that he was going to be forsaken. He knew everything about his life, and I'm going to tell you something, without any moment of doubt, Jesus Christ knew the second he stepped in that boat, a storm was coming. He knew it. You need to know who you are. The second thing I think you need to do to be able to sleep through a storm is you need to recognize that these storms in our life have benefits. There's a reason. The Lord has tailor-made storms for all of us. Sometimes they're used to get our attention. Sometimes they're used to humble us. Sometimes they're used to slow us down. Sometimes they're used to teach us things about the Lord we'd never know without them. But I'm telling you, the Lord can throw a storm in your life in a heartbeat. That's not a reason to doubt the Lord or fear the Lord. That's a, doubt to, that's, that's a reason to acknowledge Him and know that He's in control of our life. And if you look back on your life, you will see that some of your greatest spiritual times of growth were in the middle of a storm, a middle of the time of your life when it was turned inside out. God proved himself faithful. Your faith grew. Your belief in Christ grew. Your prayer life grew. The fact that you saw God grew. All of these things grow exponentially in the midst of a trial. So know the benefits of storms, and I think you can rest in them. And the third thing that I realized thinking about Jesus sleeping in the bow of that boat is that we need to know the authority and the power that we possess. Jesus Christ knew that he had authority over nature. He knew that he had authority over the winds and the waves. He knew that he had the authority over the sea. He knew that. And knowing that allowed him 
to rest. Friend, listen to me. You want to learn to rest in the midst of a storm? It's not so much of knowing thyself. It's knowing whose you are. Whose you are, not who you are for us. Who do we belong to? We belong to the Lord. Jesus said, nothing will separate you from my love. Nothing will separate you from the hand of my Father. Nothing can sever that relationship or that tie. There's no storm that's ever been made or created that you've ever encountered that will tear you away from the love of the Lord. So we need to know whose we are. We need to know the benefits of storms. When we recognize that this is either something that's going to stumble me or something that I can step up on and grow by, we're learning lessons. Don't let the storms and the suddenness of, of a trial cause you to stumble in your faith. Run to Jesus Christ like they did. Hey, if it's because of fear, it's okay. You're still running to the source of the one who can make the difference. It's when we run to others for their advice or we run to doctors or we run to psychologists or we run uh, away or, or ignore the symptoms, whatever it may be, that's where the damage occurs. Running to Christ is the first thing we should do. So know that trials have a benefit and there's a reason. And then the a power and authority, do you realize that in Christ, in Christ you've been given the ability and the power to live your life above that which happens around us? It's not that we're insulated from it, but it's that we're kept in it. We're able to pray and resist. We're able to lift up our petitions. We're able to lift up the shield of faith, our heads guarded by the helmet of salvation, the truth of righteousness. Folks, listen, the, the, the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness. We're able to survive storms and battles. The Lord has given us that ability to do that. When Jesus was arrested, a little maiden questioned Peter. Weren't you one of them? Weren't you with them? Remember, Peter denied knowing Jesus. He went three times and he cursed and he was scared to death is what it was. He didn't want to be associated with Peter and found out and I mean, with Jesus and then possibly be crucified like Jesus was. He was afraid. This same Peter is the one who after the Holy Ghost fills his heart and his life with power, he's threatened that if he keeps speaking on the name of Jesus that he's going to be arrested. He's threatened just like they threatened Jesus. And he stands boldly and he says, I can't help myself but to talk about him. He wasn't afraid of them anymore. He wasn't afraid of the, the, the authority. He was afraid of a little washwoman in the beginning. But now he stands before the Sanhedrin and he stands bold in the Lord. He knew the power and authority. That was a part of his life now. He had nothing to fear. I heard a story years ago by a pastor. He shared at a senior adult luncheon. And I, I've shared, it was years ago I shared this. I actually shared this as a devotional. But a ranch owner was, was needing a, a man to kind of manage his ranch. And he had an old grizzled farmhand walk in, a cowboy, just old leather skin from working outside. Just, just, your, just your ideal cowboy. And the ranch owner said, why should I hire you? He said, well, I ain't scared of hard work, and I know how to sleep through a storm. And the ranch owner thought, well, that's an odd combination. But the guy had their credentials, so he hired him. A few months later, at the end of a day at dusk dark, a terrible storm was blowing up. The ranch hand, the ranch owner, panicked a little bit and he ran out to where the ranch hand uh, his home was and he beat on the door and the windows he could see through the window the man was sound asleep but he couldn't wake him up so so the owner said well I ain't got time to mess with him and he jumped on his horse and he ran out to to gather up the cattle and get them into to a, uh, horses he had horses he was going to gather them into a corral to weather the storm and found them already in the corral then he ran to the barn to, to shut everything down, to keep everything from being torn up, and he found the barn was just locked up as tight as could be. And then he was on his way back home, and it occurred to him. The day he hired that guy, he said, I know how to sleep through a storm. What he meant was, 
I live a prepared life. I don't go to bed until things are taken care of. That's what he said. Now, folks, I want to tell you something. You're not going to make it through the storms of life if you hadn't taken care of some things. First and foremost is who is your life being built on? If it's not Jesus Christ, you're on sinking sand. And any storm that comes your way is going to rattle you and threaten the foundation of what you're living on. Ultimately, your life's going to crash because you're building on things that aren't going to make it through the storms. I want to see a couple of things in this story, real simple. Jesus stood, and I, and I love it because he, he actually spoke to the winds and the waves. It says he rebuked them. He rebuked them. In other words, he told them to stop. Stop it. And they obeyed it. He stopped. Suddenly there was calm. Just as sudden as it blew up, suddenly it was calm. But there was another rebuke, and I want us to see this. The other rebuke was to his disciples. There were two rebukes in the boat that day. The one that we remember is him stopping the storm, but the one we all remember is when he looked at his disciples and he said, Oh, ye of little faith, why are you so afraid? It is stingy. It is harsh. And I'm sure it hurt their feelings. But I want you to see something. I want you to understand something. When Jesus rebuked their lack of faith that created fear, when Jesus rebuked the wind and the sea, the result was the same. There was great calm. When Jesus rebukes us in our life, when Jesus points out that something's lacking or something that doesn't belong there, if we will take it to heart, we will experience great calm and peace. The truth is, we're hard-headed. And we still believe that we can handle, we're the captain of our own destiny. And I can handle anything life throws at me. Life's going to throw death at you one day. You're not going to be able to handle that. It's going to win. You better be prepared, okay? Let Jesus rebuke us. Rebuke just simply means correct and instruct. The idea of rebuke means to sort of corral and, and to, to bring everything together, and that's what he's doing. He did that with the wind, the waves, and I believe he also did that with the men in the boat that day. And the end of this story is just simple. It says the men marveled, and they were amazed. I don't think they were amazed that they got scolded. I don't think they enjoyed that part. What they were amazed at is that Jesus Christ had authority over the natural elements. He stopped it. It would be equivalent to Jesus stopping the hurricane. I mean, it was that drastic to them. It bowled them over. They didn't understand that he had that kind of power and that authority. And basically what it did, this I think was the fifth miracle uh, in this book that we see, but this miracle brought Jesus Christ to the elevation of the point of being the creator and sustainer of nature. And they recognized in just a moment the power and the authority that Jesus had. Do you have that same view of Jesus Christ? Jesus asked his disciples, Who do men say that I am? Well, some said you're a great teacher. Some said you're a prophet Elijah. Come back or... Or, 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 or the predecessor to the, to the uh, Messiah. And, of course, eventually Peter made the proclamation, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. But I want you to understand something, folks. That same question has to be answered today. Who do you say that Jesus Christ is? Well, he was a great philosopher. He was a great teacher. He, he was a miracle worker. He died for me. There's a myriad of answers, but listen to me. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you recognize him for who he is, the Son of God who, who saved me. The very cry that they made to him, Lord, save us or we perish, is the very cry that humanity should make to Christ. Lord, save me or I perish eternally. I call out to you. So knowing who Jesus is is paramount. We need to have a lot more marveling in the church today over who Jesus is. Now, folks, he's either the son of God or he's an imposter. He's either the savior who came to die for my sins and your sins or he's a fake. He's one or the other. 
There is no middle ground. His, his claims were too big. He made claims too big to get away with if he weren't the son of God. So today I want to ask you, as we together are walking through some storms, who is Jesus to you? Do you marvel at him? Do you run to him when you're fearful? Do you trust him and follow him even if it can be in a place that might be dangerous? Let's bow together. Father, I ask you today to give us discernment and honesty and truth that we might search our hearts and seek our hearts in a way that would honor you and bring glory. I ask you, Lord, to reveal to us where we stand in thee spiritually. Help us to see the truth and not our definition or what we think is true. Help us to see our spiritual condition. Help us to see our need for you in the midst of the storms that we find ourselves in. I pray for conviction. I pray, Lord, for that discernment. I pray for faith. I pray for salvation. And Lord, I want to lift up the ones that are here even this morning that are going through fierce trials. I pray, Lord, that they would turn to you. And for the ones that are here today that are going to encounter sudden, fierce trials in their future, help us to remember these words. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mike Jones is going to come sharing testimony. Folks that are that are driving up, don't head out. We're going to give him a microphone so y'all can hear. But he's going to come and share in testimony. Can you hand, just turn that one on? But I got two things I want to say to you this morning. The first thing is that, you know, I've developed, well, I've been in this, in this church really since uh, 1964 with Sharon and I got married. And in all that time, the last two years has been the sweetest, has been the greatest, has been the humbling time that I have spent in West Union because I have developed so many friends. Each one of you have uh, encouraged me. Each one of you always have been uh, asked me how I'm doing and so forth. For that friendship, all of you, I am so thankful. And you know, uh, Paul, and I got where I, I really do um, admire him, the troubles, the trials that he, that he went through. He always had time to sit and talk to, to someone, especially those that were immediately under him. Like he, the young man, uh, some people say Philemon, some say Philemon. Who did not matter, but Paul gave him instructions on what to do about friends. You know, you need to go to your friend and you tell them how much you loved them, how much you appreciated them, how much you is, uh, uh, meant to them. And I want to very quickly just read a passage of Scripture that Paul uh, t talks to a Philemon. He says, I always thank my God when I pray for you because I keep hearing about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of God's people. And I am praying that you will put into action the generosity that comes from your faith as you understand and experience all the good things we have in Christ. Your love has given me much joy and comfort. Comfort, my brother. For your kindness has often refreshed the hearts of God's people. You have a friend that has been that way to you? Seek them out. Tell them about it. Tell them what, you, what they have meant to you. If, or maybe you want to send them a card. Just do something for that friend. I'd love to do something for every one of you. That's the reason why I'm, this first part, I'm telling you how I feel about you and this church. The second part of my uh, testimony is 
Well, those of you that are my age and older, maybe a little younger, you probably remember a comedian came out of the, uh, the Delta, Mississippi, specifically Yazoo City. His name was, uh, uh oh, one of those, Jerry Clower. <laughs> Jerry Clower always had a, uh, a saying, uh, that, uh, a phrase he always used. He said, ain't God good? You know, always. And he has. Uh, he has blessed me beyond more than I can ever imagine. Uh, last week, I believe it was, yeah, last Thursday, I went and had a uh, colonoscopy done. Uh, to request my oncologist, and uh, prior to that, I had an MRI done. I mentioned that to y'all already. That it showed my cancer was decreasing in my liver. Didn't say anything about the tumor that was in my colon. Did you hear what I said? Was. God has blessed me there. The colonoscopy, when I, I watched it on the screen. I remember the first one I saw, I had a tumor in my colon the size of my thumb. The doctor said, look, you see that purple tattoo there? That's what they always call it. He said, that's where a tumor was. He said, your tumor, there's no. he said, did you have a surgery? And I said, no. Well, what about radiation? Oh, did you have radiation? I said, no. The only radiation I've had is, is on my liver. But folks, I don't have a tumor in my colon anymore. And the cancer in my liver is continually to re, uh, grow smaller and smaller. Uh, I've got one more treatment of chemo. And I'm hoping within the next three weeks I can stand here and say, Ain't God good, I'll be free of cancer. I'm expecting that, and I believe that. So that's what I wanted to tell you folks this morning, and I appreciate all of you as my friend, as my companion, as my brother and sister in Christ for all that you said to me, and those of you who've, who've helped me in many other ways, I appreciate you so much.